And the, and the research report we're discussing today is an integral part of this work. So we're delighted to be able to share it with you. And we're delighted to have so many of you on the call today. We're also very grateful to our project partners for this research. Um, the Institute for Crime and Justice Policy Research at Birkbeck, you can see Jill Hunter um, from ICPR um, on the screen in front of you. The Centre for Justice Innovation, and um, we have Stephen Whitehead and um, um, Suzanne also joining us um, from, from there. And Victim Support, you can see Jeffrey DeMarco from Victim Support on the screen as well. So they will all be presenting today and joining us for our Q&A discussion. In terms of what we're going to cover, um, the first presentation is going to be by um, Jill Hunter on the common findings from research. And what do I mean by common findings? I mean the findings that were found to be true in many or all areas of the criminal justice system. Then we'll take a more detailed look at the victim specific findings and um, with Jeffrey DeMarco of Victim Support. And Emily Giles from the Bell Foundation will talk a little bit about policy implications of the research. Uh, and finally, before we go to the Q&A with um, panellists, Suzanne Smith and Stephen Whitehead will talk a little bit about CJI and also introduce the practice focused guidance for people working in the probation service. The presenters are then going to join us for a Q&A session uh, and we hope you'll have many questions for them. So as questions come to you as you're listening to the speakers, you can, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you can see um, a Q&A button. Just submit any questions using that um, Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and I'll put these to the panel in the session. You can also, and you're already doing this, um, make use of the chat function at any time, for comments, um, additional questions, to introduce yourselves or to make contact with other attendees. So um, let's get started, shall we? I'm delighted to welcome Jill Hunter. She's a senior researcher at ICPR. Uh, and she was the lead researcher on this project. So we're very grateful to you, Jill. And Jill's going to take us through some of the key findings from the research. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen. Can everyone see that? I'm, I'm now going to stop my video as I prefer not to see myself when I'm talking. We can see that. Thank you, Jill. That's great. Okay, so this, as Radha said, is a very brief overview of our research that draws out some of the key and common findings about language barriers across the criminal justice system. And the project was a partnership uh, involving ICPR, Victim Support and Centre for Justice Innovation. And as Radha said, my colleagues are gonna present on some of the more specific and detailed findings and outputs. And I also wanted to clarify at the start, the use of the acronym ESL, which is gonna be repeated a lot in the next 30 or 40 minutes. It stands for English as a second or additional language. And it refers to individuals who have had exposure to a language other than English from birth and have developed or are developing their ability in English later in life. And ESL encompasses uh, wide variations in proficiency in English. Okay. So we investigated how speaking ESL affects experiences and outcomes for adults who are in contact with the criminal justice system as victims, witnesses, suspects, defendants, and people uh, with convictions. It was exploratory research that aimed to kind of boost our understanding of the nature and implications of language barriers at different points in the system and when in contact with different criminal justice agencies to raise awareness of how language barriers might affect the quality of contact and access to justice, identify areas for improvement in policy and practice, and support development and implementation of these improvements through engaging with practitioners. And this last aspect of the work is described in more detail in, in the pres presentations that will follow. Okay. So we combined elements of review with primary research. We examined what legal rights and entitlements there are to language support, including any specific policies or practice guidance for different criminal justice agencies with a focus on supporting speakers of ESL. We searched for data to gauge numbers of people and the range of first languages that are spoken amongst those in contact with the criminal justice system. And we conducted primary research 
largely in two geographic areas in England to take a more detailed look at how language diversity was being accommodated and supported uh, on the ground. So this included interviews with police, probation, prison, crime prosecution service, those working in voluntary services for victims of crime and services supporting refugees and asylum seekers. And we interviewed interpreters who work across the criminal justice system. And victim support also conducted a national survey of their staff and volunteers to explore experiences of supporting victims of crime who speak ESL. And we interviewed people with uh, lived experience of the criminal justice system. Unfortunately, the timing of our fieldwork in sort of 2020, early 21, meant that the research access that we had been granted to interview people in prison and under probation supervision was cancelled due to COVID-19. But thanks to um, colleagues at Prison Reform Trust and the Criminal Justice Alliance, we were able to promote our research and to get some feedback from people and also to interview some people who'd been released from custody and had acted as peer supporters for those who speak ESL. So assessing numbers of people who are speakers of ESL in the criminal justice system is very difficult. No statutory criminal justice agency routinely collects information about spoken languages of their contacts. And if that kind of detail is available internally, and, and it may well be, it's not in the public domain, nor is it very easily retrievable for review and analysis. Language doesn't feature in the demographic data used to monitor how people are treated and the outcomes they achieve in the criminal justice system as a means of checking for disproportionality and inequality. Um, so we had to rely on proxy measures, including requests made for interpretation and translation and the number of foreign national offenders. And we used freedom of information requests to seek out language um, information about language. What we can say based on these different proxy measures is that a wide range of languages are spoken in the criminal justice system. Data received in a FOI request from Ministry of Justice, which covered uh, the courts, Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service, Prison Inspectorate and the Salvation Army that supports victims of modern day slavery. They recorded interpretation requests for 163 different spoken languages in the 12 months to March 2020. Most commonly, these were for Eastern European languages and the top two tended to be Polish and Romanian. The courts were the most common user of professional language support. And um, my colleagues at Victim Support are gonna highlight the findings of their review of their internal service management data. So, Individuals do have rights and entitlements to professional interpretation and translation, and these tend to align with legal principles, statutory codes, and agreed good practice for enabling the delivery of justice, as well as UK obligations under various international treaties. And responsibilities are assigned to police prosecutors, defence lawyers, and prison staff to organise competent or accredited interpreters and to ensure the translation of key documents and the expectation of the criminal justice inspectorates try and reinforce these requirements. And in brief, this correlates to language support for victims and witnesses when they report crimes and provide evidence to the police or in court, outlined in the Victims Code of Practice and Witness Charter for arrestees and defendants to ensure their understanding of charges against them, the right to independent and free legal advice, Police and Criminal Evidence Act, and to a fair trial, which is enshrined in Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And for those held in prison, uh, they have a right to be informed in a language they understand about prison regulations, the regime, the range of health and education services available, and any disciplinary action against them. And that's covered by various prison rules. And there's also judicial guidance include, included in the Crime Court Compendium and the Equal Treatment Bench Book that is about ensuring witnesses and defendants are appropriately supported to understand and participate in court proceedings that concern them and are not expected to manage or get by in English. So that's a kind of brief synopsis of what it says on paper. 
Um, in our empirical research, we wanted to explore how language support is applied in practice. And it's fair to say that practitioners in the statutory service were generally well aware of these rights and entitlements, but getting access to language support was influenced by a range of other factors, what we've described in our report as the messy realities of the criminal justice system. And this includes things like time pressure, as to typified in these interview extracts um, from police officers. You know, it's not a priority. There's lots of other things going on. Information about an individual's language needs was not always collected or shared by agencies. And it could be very much dependent on the quality of notes or of the note taker remembering to, to make that point. And practitioners also described using their professional judgment to assess whether someone required an interpreter or could get by in English. And there was no standard approach or guidance about the level of English language proficiency that might be needed to understand and participate effectively in criminal justice processes. And most of the practitioners we interviewed had never received any training about supporting uh, speakers of ESL or were unaware of any professional guidance on language support beyond perhaps you know, procedures for booking an interpreter. And despite increasing language diversity in the UK over past decades, criminal justice services are largely monolingual, aside from provision in Welsh language, which is obviously protected in law. So information resources, advice, etc., were generally only available in English. And this was seen to be you know, sometimes limiting what could be done for speakers of ESL. So we also wanted to investigate what less formal methods were being used to respond to language support needs, you know, the strategies for getting by. Um, we know that uh, there is generally more access to professional language support in the statutory uh, services, although, you know, as I've pointed out, there are various potential hoops to go through to get to that. But certainly in the voluntary sector, there's much less resource for enlisting professional language uh, support. So Google Translate was a common immediate go-to resource that people mentioned. Interviewees also drew on the language skills of fellow staff, of um, their volunteers, and also the friends and, <clears throat> and families of, of their contacts. Although this came with some very crucial caveats about the circumstances where using family might be in a appropriate you know when you're taking evidential statements and practitioners also reported adjusting their own use of English to communicate with speakers of ESL and this is in keeping with wider recognition about the complex terminology and the technical vocabulary used in the criminal justice system and how that acts as a barrier to effective participation even for those who are native speakers. And peer support was another commonly used method, and I'm, I'm going to come on to that in a moment. So sometimes the interviews actually presented a chance to reflect on what resources services currently had, and the ethnic and linguistic diversity of staff in the criminal justice system was seen as perhaps an underdeveloped resource that could actually strength, strengthen service capacities uh, for accommodating different language requirements. Uh, we were told about targeting recruitment initiatives in policing that had aimed to attract people into the service who were fluent, fluent speakers of other languages. And practitioners also gave numerous examples of how volunteers were being recruited and deployed to provide language support. And they were an especially important source of interpretation for voluntary services who were working with asylum seekers. So through the lived experience and practitioner interviews, we explored different ways in which language barriers uh, can impede uh, access to justice and rehabilitation. And the findings were that, you know, there can certainly be limits to the range and type of support or intervention that is available to speakers of ESL. The kinds of provision that might be affected includes general assistance and information to guide one through criminal justice processes, access to legal advice, or indeed, as outlined in this first extract, being supported to understand legal advice, 
Um, and there was a common additional factor in that a lot of people, certainly reported in our interviews with probation, a lot of people who spoke ESL were also dealing with immigration issues. So they were trying to navigate both the criminal justice and the immigration uh, systems. It definitely limited the range of rehabilitative interventions as part of community supervision under probation and various services that were available in prison. And this final point on this slide is, a, is about you know, people wanting to be able to offer English language education as part of rehabilitation and resettlement, but it, it wasn't always available. So based on interviews and feedback we have, um, we found that peer support was a lifeline for speakers of ESL in prison. Uh, you know, there are, there are more formal programmes of, of peer support, such as the excellent Shannon Trust, um, but there are many sort of day-to-day -day language barriers in navigating prison life, and day-to-day -day informal language support was often provided by fellow prisoners. You know, help with translating prison notices, reading menus or labels, and this was especially crucial and provided a lifeline during COVID-19. And this uh, second interview extract here is from a, um, a, a current prisoner who uh, was called out to help uh, during COVID. And we were also told of some positive experiences of prison management facilitating the development of peer-based work to fill gaps in language support, including activities such as you know, translating key information for speakers of ESL. And that's described in this third um, interview extract, a strength-based approach. Okay. So we identified five key areas for policy and practice reform that could help to enhance support for those who, who speak ESL. And they span contexts in which you know, professional interpretation and translation are more readily available, but also where access to language services is, is, is more limited. First point we made is the need to collect better data to improve our knowledge and understanding of language barriers and their impact. So we highlight the importance of criminal justice agencies routinely collecting information about the spoken languages of all of their contacts. As pointed out, there are clear rights and entitlements to interpretation and translation. And if these are consistently upheld, you know, this would certainly help ensure that speakers of ESL are able to understand and participate in judicial and other criminal justice processes. So we highlight steps to promote consistency, including senior accountability for upholding rights to language support, strict evaluation of this by the inspectorates and training and awareness for criminal justice staff about assessing language proficiency and the need for support. And addressing monolingualism of, of service provision, we've highlighted the need for regular reviews of services and uh, of, of service users and potential users language requirements to ensure that written materials are translated um, and appropriately targeted. And we also stress the need to increase access to English language education. You know, this was considered a, a crucial element of rehabilitation and settlement support, but it was often limited and, and not available. Uh, as I've mentioned, a glaring finding that there is little or no training or guidance for practitioners on supporting speakers of ESL beyond instructions on things like booking interpreters. So we've highlighted the need for guidance that draws together current expertise, learning and other useful resources to raise awareness, the nature and impact of language barriers, but also potential cultural barriers that might affect communication and to help promote good practice in overcoming those. And the outputs from this project led by Victim Support and the Centre for Justice Innovation are intended to begin to fill this training and guidance gap. Um, as I noted, we, we also identified ways to enhance and develop existing capacities and resources, including making the most of and developing the language skills that already exist within services and via volunteers. And, and it's clear, I think, that peer support is hugely important and developing peer-based approaches to providing language support seems to be a very sensible investment, obviously accepting that there are clear 
situations where you would absolutely need professional uh, interpretation. And that's kind of a, a brief uh, whistle stop tour of our research project. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jill. That was a brilliant whistle stop tour, um, which raises a huge number of questions in my mind, which I hope we'll have time to get through. Um, and I can see questions starting to appear in the chat. Everyone, if you put your questions in, and we'll, I think we'll hold them until we get into the Q&A um, section of the webinar today. Any that we can answer immediately, we will. The others will, um, I'll put to the panellists later on. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Geoffrey DeMarco. Uh, of Victim Support. Uh, Jeffrey is Assistant Director of Knowledge and Insight at Victim Support, and he's going to take us through some of the victim specific findings. Over to you, Jeffrey. Thank you very much, Rada, and um, thank you very much to Jill, everyone, for laying quite a concrete foundation for, for what the rest of the presentations and hopefully discussion will, will be built upon. So I'm just going to share my screen um, with everyone. <clears throat> And if you can just confirm, Radha, that you can see that. I can see it. It's quite small at the moment. Yeah. Isn't too. Um, How is that? Perfect. Thank there you. There we are. So, as as Jill appropriately um, stated, I am going to focus on the experience of victims and witnesses who speak ESL in their interactions at various points of the criminal justice system and the process. Um, I'm representing Victim Support. Um, we are an independent charity dedicated to supporting victims of crime and those who have experienced trauma. And we do this through offering specialized help to assist any victim of crime, regardless of if they have reported to the police or followed the criminal justice process to get themselves to a place in which they feel comfortable, confident, and are able to cope with their experience. So the findings I'll take you through are very much based on a number of in-depth qualitative interviews with practitioners from the statutory and voluntary sector, as well as victims and witnesses who speak ESL, in which we were able to discuss their experience with. I'm just trying to change my slide. So to give you a really quick snapshot, let's lay the foundation down right now to understand what we're seeing in the third sector and what we understand to be this group in which we are seeking to provide additional support for. So between April 2019, and March 2020, so right up until the beginning of the very first COVID-19 lockdown, we saw approximately 750 service users across our organization who had English as a second or additional language. The majority of these individuals were female between the ages of 31 and 50, with nearly two thirds having been referred due to experiencing violence either with or without injury. Nearly one fourth of these individuals had been the victim of crime at least once before. So again, some of you may be thinking there, sitting there thinking that is this a large number? And I think that is a, a relevant question in terms of the the research, this important and exciting research that you're hearing about, but also in the work that we do, in that we are there to support individuals, regardless of their background, regardless of their experiences, to ensure that they have access to justice. So this helps paint the picture of those coming through our organizations. However, this is just one part of a much larger puzzle. Now, on April 1st, 2021, the new Victims Code came into effect. The Victims Code um, essentially presented 12 overarching rights that ensured victims are able to make informed choices and are treated with respect, dignity, sensitivity, compassion, and courtesy across the entire process. The first of those 12 rights is presented for you there on the screen 
and is articulated as the ability to understand and be understood. I add additional information in subsections 1.3 and 1.4, which highlight that if you do have difficulty understanding or speaking English, you have the right to interpreter to assist and facilitate with your understanding across different points of that criminal justice process. Secondly, you also have the right to receive the translation of any document where it is essential for the purposes of that criminal justice process that you understand and read that document. So folks, it's not just about being there to support those that may be having difficulty. It's also about ensuring that their rights as a victim are met and that they are treated in the same way as any other individual of crime. So continuing on with the theme of a whistle -top stop tour, I'm going to take you through approximately six general themes that we uncovered with, with colleagues and partners throughout this, throughout this endeavor around what witnesses and victims seem to be experiencing at different junctures of their criminal justice journey. The first is around service and interpretation provision. It's a patchy provision, but the support when offered and under the right conditions is effective. So I'm not going to read the quotes in the following slides that are on the right hand side of the slide. However, I will urge you all to take a peek um, and I will summarize the general themes and understanding that we extracted from this. So some of those we spoke with spoke very positively about the receipt of language support, which is again, very good news. However, others were not offered language support translation or interpretation at all. This was especially true at that initial point of police contact. Sometimes it was deemed unnecessary by the responding law enforcement officers as it was perceived that the victim or the individual contacting the police had a workable or passable level of English language. So again, a decision was made for the victim, for the witness, in terms of whether or not they required support. Sadly, situations like this can result in a number of adverse consequences and outcomes to the wider criminal justice process. This could include inaccurate statements being taken to the erosion of trust in the wider criminal justice system and the police. Those inaccurate statements could also then be admissible as evidence in court. So it's really, really important that there is an awareness and some form of needs assessment of that English language provision is provided from the onset. Our second theme is around issues that may present themselves in providing interpretation and translation support that are beyond the point of language itself. So even where support is offered, there often can be knowledge gaps in the more nuanced processes and findings around the criminal justice system. What I mean by that is providing simple translation without an awareness of how the criminal justice system proceeds, how prosecutions are made, your rights under the victim's code, without a wider awareness of these things, those pieces of information will not be shared and provided to those witnesses and victims who speak ESL. So it's not just about that language support, it needs to be grounded in the wider context of the experience of victimization and the criminal justice system. Sometimes additional tools that would facilitate support, such as Google Translate or telephone interpretation, could be deemed as less helpful. So the experience of crime can leave one feeling very fearful, anxious, 
unsure and uncertain of what to do next with their life and what processes to follow. Having face-to-face -face support provision may facilitate the development of rapport and trust in navigating that process. Using these non-face-to-face -face means and mechanisms may not allow that. Now, I completely appreciate that we all have been on a two-year journey together through a global pandemic, but important to consider some of the basics of non-verbal cues and the importance of developing rapport and attachment in these situations. There's also a need to ensure diversity across the services provided and the wider CJS, as this can be built on by having a representative workforce, a representative interpretation service or a criminal justice system, it's more likely that we can increase cultural knowledge, increase the understanding of some of these wider needs for those that speak ESL. Through our interviews, we identified a situation where an individual was mistaken for a perpetrator and through subsequent uh, engagements with victim and witness groups across the organization, we're seeing this as being not a single occurrence, being more common um, than once thought. Part of this may be because individuals are not believed by the police because of their lack of confidence and articulation with the English language. Often, if the perpetrators or the alleged perpetrators were fluent or English speakers, they could communicate fluently in English and perhaps lead and direct the line of inquiry and discussion down the avenues they perceived. There is also a perception that victims and witnesses were less likely to be listened to once they were identified as having English as a second or additional language. So this perception of a lack of confidence and perhaps being less accurate given their struggles in articulating themselves in English. Point four, language support needs are dynamic and unique. This is a really important yet simple point. It's not just about understandability and comprehension at that initial police encounter. It's about treating language need and support fluidly across that criminal justice process. It may be in the initial instance, they do not need the support and understanding what the police are sharing with them or how to make a report. But as the case and the investigation progress, it may be that with more complex terminology and legalese and with complicated systems of referral and where to seek compensation and how to get additional information, different forms of support are needed. And maybe they need more help with written support or the reading support or in speaking. And again, it should not be treated like a tick box exercise in which you offer the support at one time only. It should be treated fluidly across that entire process. Due to some of the anxieties or individual resilience levels and vulnerabilities, it's very likely as well that different victims and witnesses will require different levels of support at different points. We also spoke or heard about informal mechanisms of support, and it came out clearly that those that lacked informal support systems, such as their family and friends, did require a greater level of emotional support. So some victims and witnesses were confused in the first instance or not informed by the police about being contacted by organizations such as our own. So there was a greater need for awareness raising around who and what organizations such as victim support are there for and what they are meant to do in helping victims and witnesses access the justice and the processes they deserve. The fifth point is language support should always be offered. There were cases in which we heard from both those that spoke ESL as well as practitioners and the third sector where frontline criminal justice professionals were reluctant to offer language support in case the suggestion offended victims. So although they had the best intentions of not offending or inferring behaviors, 
um, inferring ability, this lack of offer could often lead or be perceived to lead to more negative consequences. So the argument is that language support should always be offered when it is available and that offer should be done sensitively and tactfully. And that tactful approach is particularly important for victims and survivors of certain crimes, such as hate crime and terrorism, where often the victims and the survivors will fear that their protected characteristics or the identity as speaking ESL may make them more of a target in the future to alleged perpetrators. And lastly, as our fifth, sixth point, there's a huge, huge need for training and, and, and guidelines, which again, this fantastic project is leading the way in informing. So there is a lack of consistent training for practitioners on how to support service users who speak English as a second or additional language. It's important that good practice is developed from the bottom up rather than the top down. And I do think, again, iterating what colleagues on this call and on this panel have done. And there really is an importance for additional cultural training. It's all right to not necessarily know the intricacies of each and every single language, as, as, as Jill shared, there's many of them and not everyone has that superpower, but it's important to be aware and to know what you do know and to be aware of what you do not know. So good practice guidance for practitioners have been developed for working with victims and witnesses of crime who speak ESL. So it's guidance for working with an interpreter, suggestions for working with interpreters and effective communications with victim and witnesses who speak ESL. It is understanding those cultural considerations and interpreter briefings and giving examples of how to offer support and introduce oneself. You can see all of the rest of the outputs through the link that's provided on this slide. Briefly summing up our recommendations, I can make them in five kind of key, very five quick key points. The first is that we absolutely must adhere to the victim's code and offer support tactfully, including at different points of the criminal justice system. Second, there needs to be accountability. It is currently in development, but monitoring needs to occur. And this isn't necessarily to, to make people feel like if they get mistakes or if they make mistakes, they'll be fired, but we need to improve. And accountability frameworks provide us with the evidence base of what needs to happen Next. Third, an initial needs and language assessment conducted by the police should also not be relied upon across the entire process. It should be offered at that point, as I've already mentioned, but it needs to be revisited as the process evolves. All police forces and the Crown Prosecution Service should undertake review of their translation services a state of the nation to identify what they may have access to, what they are offering well, and where there are areas for improvement. Victims and witnesses must be aware of the different modes of language support available to them. So that's, again, not just interpretation. It may also be translation so that they know where and when across the process they have help. And they should also be, as all victims of crime, adequately informed of how their cases progress, including time scale. They may need help for understanding our complicated and complex criminal justice processes. Lastly, and from a victim support perspective, we do not want individuals that have the right to access to our services or need our services to shy away. So we would urge the role of all victim services are explained appropriately to victims and witnesses with ESL. Thank you very much for listening. And again, just to applaud and thank all of my colleagues and partners and our internal research team for the work that they contributed to this throughout the process. It's an absolute pleasure and I look forward to the discussion afterwards. Jeffrey, thank you so much. Um, absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm just struck yet again by the by the extent and the intractability of some of those issues, but I do very much um, applaud the practicality of your recommendations. Okay, so on that note, I'm going to pass over to Emily Giles, um, who is Criminal Justice Policy and Programme Manager at the Bell Foundation, and she leads on the Foundation's criminal justice work 
to talk um, briefly about some of the policy implications of this research. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Rada. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen and get some notes up. There we go. Uh, yes, thanks very much. So, um, as Rada said, so Jill and Jeffrey have outlined the problems that we see in the system and the, the sort of the big recommendations for change. Um, there's obviously a lot to unpack there. So what I'm going to do is just take a minute to step back and address perhaps those of you in the room who are asking what you yourselves might be able to do about this. Um, a lot of these we know are big systemic problems uh, and we know that they are they're big and they're difficult to fix. Um, but what gives me a lot of hope in this work is that I'm yet to meet anyone who doesn't recognize that this is a problem and wants to fix it. Um, we very much find in our work the obstacle is never a lack of will, it's the usual constraints that we know everyone working in this sector is facing. It's time, resources, and sometimes that sort of knowledge of, of how, of what to do. Um, so that's where I'm gonna start. I'm just gonna talk for a few moments um, about where to start. So uh, to use a overused expression, there's, there's some low hanging fruit here, but the one easiest thing that you can do um, whatever your position, if you work directly on the front lines or perhaps you manage people on the front lines, you run, a, you run a charity in the sector, the one easiest thing you can do is to introduce some guidance for everybody that you work with or that works for you. Um, so luckily, as, as has been mentioned, there are some outputs from this series that would be really helpful. Um, Suzanne is going to follow up after me and talk specifically about one of those in a few minutes. But those are, you know, they're practical, they're free. You can download them today for your staff, put a link to them on your intranet put them in your induction packs uh, and they can make a real difference from, from today. Um, and if there are still gaps, if those, if those don't quite fit the work that you're doing or you would like some further guidance, come and talk to us at the Bell Foundation. Uh, we and our partners are looking at how we might be able to help more, uh, looking at developing a suite of training and resources, we hope. Um, and we want to talk to the sector and find out more about what you need, what would be, what would be helpful. Um, on to the slightly bigger, challenges. Um, these are more difficult, but they would also have more impact. Um, so I'm going to focus in on three specific things here. So data. Data um, is the big one for us. We can't understand the scale of this problem uh, until data starts to be recorded in the same way that other key characteristics have been for years. Um, that way we can start to understand the scale of the problem, where the need is biggest, uh, and the system can start to target resources. Uh, this is very difficult on a system-wide level. We know that this is you know, a big thing, um, but everyone here again can think about what they can do. If you work for a charity or if you provide a service, you're probably already collecting uh, data for, for equalities monitoring. Can you introduce a question about first language? Would that help you to better understand your service users? Um, and if you do work more centrally in the system, if you work for a statutory agency, think about this, think about where, when, and how you could start to collect this data on a bigger scale. The second thing is training. So this is more difficult to roll out than guidance, uh, but it's also much more impactful. We are developing some training uh, specifically for the criminal justice sector, which is based on years of, of similar work in the education sector. Uh, and many of our partners that we're currently working with have or are currently developing some training. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're also hoping over time to develop more uh, in response to what the sector needs. So uh, again, come and talk to us about that. Um, if you're restrained by time and money, don't let that be a limitation. Think about sending just one or two people to some training. Um, can you, in, can you, you know, implement them as a language champion? Can you encourage them to come back and share what they've learned? Um, give them a little extra time and space, perhaps in their day job, to make some improvements. And the third one, this is a big one, is the quality of language support that's being provided. Um, and this often comes down to commissioning. So we know how difficult getting things right in commissioning can be. We know the constraints that, that go with that. Um, but this is really important. As we hope we've shown, language creates really significant barriers for people. Uh, and it's disadvantaging people, it's disempowering people, and it's isolating people. Uh, this, so this needs to be taken as seriously as other protected characteristics with high standards for support. And it should never be treated as an add-on or a nice to have. Um, we know that this is working a lot better in some places than in others. I've had the pleasure of speaking to some people um, who have really good standards of, of support going on. So we're going to be continuing to look for examples of best practice and sharing those with the sector. 
Uh, and the final things that I'll mention are about um, innovating and, and evaluating, a little bit of sort of testing and experimenting. These are things uh, peer support in particular has been touched on. We are sure that these things will make a difference, but they need a little extra push. They need to be tested and, and tried to find the exact answers. We don't pretend to know all of the answers for these at the moment. Uh, so peer support is the first one. We know that this happens in so many places anyway, um, in prisons in particular came out through the research. And sometimes this is appropriate and it's really helpful in day-to-day -day interactions, for example. Other times it's perhaps less appropriate. Um, it perhaps is too informal and ad hoc, but if done well, this is hugely valuable. So what we say is instead of stopping it, if it's happening anyway, if you have concerns, formalize it, put a policy in place, monitor it, look at the results, look at what it can do. Uh, this is something we're really keen to explore, um, again, potentially as part of a forthcoming grants program uh, later in the spring. So if you work in peer support, if you work with people who work in peer support, get in touch with us. It's something that we're really interested in sort of learning more about um, through evaluation. And something else that you can do with the resources that you already have at hand is to look at the language diversity within your own organization. So perhaps you have multilingual staff or volunteers Perhaps they would like to be doing more, but they haven't been given the opportunity or the time to make it happen. Uh, maybe they already do help, but in an informal or an unstructured way. So make the most of that diversity within your organizations. Uh, think about how you can formalize it and think about how you can use it to, for the best benefit of the people that you exist to support. Um, for all of this, we don't have all of the answers. Uh, we know that a lot of the best answers come from the sector itself, come from people who work on the front line. So I am going to be, as part a big part of my work over the next year, is going to be looking at how we can better share best practice and perhaps build up a network of people who are, who are working in the sector on the front line um, and looking at how we can convene that. So please do follow up, get in touch, and we would, uh, we would love to see how, how much we can help beyond what we've done already. That was me. That was very whistle, top, whistle stop. Thank you, Emily. That is great. And thank you for helping us to get slightly close to back on track in terms of time. But um, more seriously, thank you for such thoughtful and grounded calls to action. That was very helpful. So before we go into uh, the Q&A session panelists, and thank you for um, to people who put in Q&As in the chat, we will pick those up um, in the Q&A session very shortly. Before we get into that, um, Stephen Whitehead and Suzanne Smith for, from the Centre for Justice and Innovation are going to talk briefly. And ap apologies, if Suzanne and, and um, Stephen, you can close out by two o'clock, then it gives us enough time for the Q&A, um, about what CJI does. And also, as Emily referenced, um, introduce a practice focused guidance for people working in the probation services. So over to you guys. Thank you. So for those of you who don't know the Centre for Justice Innovation, we're a charity that works to promote evidence-based reform in both the criminal and family justice systems. And we particularly focus towards engaging with frontline practice. We work with practitioners and service users to undertake research to support the development of new practice and to promote policy change. We are really privileged to work with Victim Support and ICPR on this project, which for us really ties into our interest in what we refer to as procedural fairness, which is um, an academic framework which lets us explore whether and how people feel that they get fairly treated by the justice system, whether they understand the process, whether they have a voice, whether they feel respectfully treated. And of course, language barriers place huge obstacles in front of these really important considerations. So for this project, we responded to the research findings by working with a group of probation practitioners to develop a tailor-made guide for them in helping to overcome language barriers. Our hope here is, first of all, that this makes a material impact on the way that probation works on language barriers. So we're going to be working with the probation service to help disseminate and promote this work. But given the recommendations that you've heard already on um, the need for guidance and for training, we hope this also serves as a bit of a proof of concept of how individual individual disciplines, individual practitioners can have guidance that is tailored for them, tailored for around their existing skills and the, you know, the very real organizational constraints and organizational capacities that they have to access language support. 
Um, so that's probably enough for me. I'm now gonna hand over to my colleague, Suzanne Smith, who actually led on designing and delivering this guidance to say a little bit more about how we develop the guidance and then about the um, content. Over to you, Suzanne. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so yeah, a lot of it has already been mentioned, so I'll, I'll try and move through this part pretty quickly. Um, I think Jill already mentioned that in the research, it was identified that practitioners in both the statutory and voluntary sectors were lacking guidance for working effectively with individuals who speak ESL and specifically good practice when working with a service user through an interpreter. So probation practitioners specifically identified um, that they receive guidance on the process of booking an interpreter, but nothing on why and how interpretation services should be used. And they identified a number of challenges with the current practice, including a lack of defined methods for assessing English proficiency, um, limited understanding or training of when of how to work effectively with interpreters, and misunderstandings about the role of interpreters, including expectations that they should provide more than just translation, but also cultural context or mediation during interactions. And prior to putting this guidance together, as Stephen mentioned, we held a workshop with probation practitioners and interpreters to get their views on the research findings, to share experiences and gain a better understanding of each other's roles and to also ask what they would find most useful in a guidance document. And throughout the process, we continue to consult with both practitioners from probation and interpreters as well on the content and style of the guidance as it was developed to make sure that it was as useful as possible. Um, so just to give you a very brief overview of some of the contents of the guidance and just giving a few examples from each section of the document. Um, first, just to mention that it's always important to check with the service user if they require an interpreter. Some may present as quite proficient speakers of English, but they may find it difficult to understand the complex language and the legal jargon that's often used in the criminal justice system and in documents such as court orders and license conditions. And where there is a language barrier, efforts should be made to ensure that interpreter is available for most, if not all, communications. However, we know that that's not always possible. So we have included some tips on effective communication when an interpreter is not present. This includes using plain English without slang, avoiding complex or overly long sentences, and always checking that the service user understands what you're saying. Um, we recommend the use of short answer, yes, no, or closed questions to check understanding and where possible to use pictorial resources like a picture timetable to help explain appointments. Always follow up with written communication, a letter, text or email. And again, use plain English and short, simple sentences and use pictures where possible. Um, for probation appointments, we, avoid, we uh, recommend that you avoid asking friends or family of a service user or anyone without formal training and interpretation as there's no guarantee that the information will be translated accurately or treated confidentially. And if there is any doubt about whether the service user can understand what you're saying, then please end the conversation and rearrange for when an interpreter can be present. Misunderstandings in these meetings could lead to a significant consequence such as a breach of license. So before the meeting, um, it's important to check if the service user has a preference regarding the gender of the interpreter. Um, for example, a male service user with a history of domestic abuse may be unwilling to discuss his offence through a female interpreter and where possible, try and accommodate this preference to gather the relevant information required. Um, consider the information, uh, consider the environment where the meeting will take place. You might need a bigger room than normal as there'll be an extra person and one that's quiet and free from distraction and additional time might also be needed. Where possible, try and prepare the interpreter for discussions about sensitive and distressing subject matter and um, by providing some brief details about the type of offence or behaviour you're hoping to discuss. And then finally, ask the interpreter if you're unsure about anything. They'll be able to answer any questions, provide clarification about their role. Um, and during the session, so we have developed a one page help sheet that can either be translated into different languages before the meeting and handed to the service user, or it can be translated by the interpreter at the beginning of the meeting. And it's intended to provide um, some further information about how the probation appointment is going to run and what to expect of the interpreter. Um, and given the nature of what's discussed during probation appointments, it's, it's essential that you check that the interpreter and service user don't know each other. They may come from the same small communities. Um, and it's important that they don't know each other either directly or indirectly through friends or family. Um, reassure the service user that interpreters cannot share what's discussed outside of the meeting. It's also important to remind the service user that anything that they say will be interpreted and that they shouldn't say anything to the interpreter that they do not want repeated to their probation officer. 
And some interpreters may have an awareness of relevant cultural and political circumstances, which enable them to provide some cultural context to the conversation, but it's important to remember that they cannot provide an assessment of the individual based on an awareness of their cultural background. And when drawing the session to a, clo a close, outline the main points of the discussion and check if the service user has any questions or needs clarification about anything, including in relation to the use of the interpreter. Um, it's useful to ask the interpreter and the service user if they feel anything could be done differently to improve the effectiveness of communication during the appointment. Making some small adjustments to how the session is run might help to develop relationships and improve the effectiveness of the sessions. And it's important to include, include any reflections regarding the impact of using the interpreter in your case records and anything that you did during the session to mitigate this impact. And finally, allow a couple of minutes at the end of the session once the service user is left to check in with the interpreter. This also helps having the interpreter and service user leave at slightly different times um, and it reduces the risk of the service user approaching the interpreter outside of the appointment venue to discuss anything without the presence of the probation officer. So um, outside of the guidance document, probation practitioners and interpreters had a number of suggestions for how we could further improve practice for working with service users who speak ESL. And these include, as has been mentioned um, before, training, training for probation officers on working with individuals who speak ESL, including guidance on when to use an interpreter and more information on the role of the interpreter. One of the probation officers that we spoke with noted that they had some standard induction packs, but none that provided more general information about the probation service for someone who has no previous experience or knowledge of it. And this information could, could include what probation is, how it works with other agencies, what a license is, what a community order is, as well as the consequences for not engaging. Um, and while induction packs and help sheets can be really useful, it's also recognised that some service users might have limited reading skills. Um, one suggestion was a pre-recorded video detailing the same information, which may support their future engage engagement with the service and also help them to understand better their situation. And finally, just to say that if it's helpful, we have some capacity to speak with probation colleagues in more detail about the guidance. So please just get in touch if you're interested in speaking more about it with us. And thank you. Suzanne and Stephen, thank you so much. Um, what an excellent and practical resource that is. Um, and I've had a, a comment about how we can access it. Um, I think it'd be very, very useful indeed. Okay, so could our panellists switch their cameras back on and we'll start um, the Q&A session. Now we're due to finish at um, 2.30, um, so let's take about 20 minutes so we've got time to close off. And thank you to people who've started to put um, questions in the chat already. Some really um, fascinating discussion to have, I think. Um, so my first question, um, picking up on one of uh, the questions we had um, in the uh, Q&A session was, um, Emily, you talked about um, that there are examples of where this is working well. You know, when we're faced with these big intractable looking issues, one of the constructive ways to start is to look at where it's working well. And I'd love to hear from um, Jill um, and Jeffrey um, and perhaps Stephen and Suzanne as well about examples where they're seeing this working well and what is it that makes the difference in a very kind of resource constrained environment. Should we start with you, Jill, and then we'll move around the panel. Yeah, I think Emily, uh, I think you might have touched on this. Uh, what we found in our interviews is there's a re the I mean, it might be selection bias, but basically people were really interested in improving things and reflecting on, you know, on how their services could improve uh, and, and adapt things for speakers of ESL. And, and I'd say, in, obviously, we've made the point that in the statutory sector, you, you have more funding for professional language support. So I think you're seeing a lot of innovation and particularly um, kind of developing volunteer workforce in the voluntary sector. And that's quite heartening that, you know, people are very keen to, uh, in fact, one service had no money or not very much money for professional interpretation support, but they had got this workforce together who covered lots of different languages and, and they trained them to help them provide their service in quite challenging circumstances. So I think, yeah, in summary, I think there's a, there's a lot of kind of want to, to make things better. And that is quite heartening, I think. Great, thank you. Jeffrey. 
Yeah, thanks, Rod. And I think it's a really good question when it comes to when it comes from that angle of, of victims and witnesses. Now, as I mentioned in part of my presentation, you know, we offer quite a bespoke tailor-made form of support, um, regardless of the process or the kind of pathway that the, the victim or witness is going to follow. So in those situations, it can be, you know, very much dependent upon local relationships. Um, who who one knows and how we can get that additional support or who we can signpost. However, our our support line, which is a 24-7 kind of resource for victims of, of crime to call confidentially to kind of seek out how they can get further support and 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 what they need to do, has a partnership with a large translation interpretation service where we are able to get fairly promptly interpretation support right then and there. Now we understand that that's not the only support that will be needed in terms of language provision. However, it does hopefully and anecdotally through conversations we've had allow for, you know, that it allows our caseworkers to demonstrate they have the understanding, the compassion, the empathy for how scary that might be when they're not understanding all these complex things. And then we can get someone in there so we can build that rapport and trust with them and hopefully get them the information they need. Thank you. And Suzanne and Stephen, anything you'd like to add? I think I'm going to hand this one over to Suzanne, who works <laughs> much more directly with practitioners. Um, I think just to kind of reiterate what Jill was saying, that I think a lot of the conversations that we were having was that there are huge challenges, but from the conversations we had, people were really keen to have these discussions and to put these this guidance in place. When we had our workshops, that was the really key message that was coming out, that they were really happy that we were starting to have these conversations and maybe putting some practical help in place. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, and it came through uh, from a few people, um, and uh, you touched on it on some, in some of their presentations. How do we get at some of the cultural barriers that are implicit, not just within translation, but within all interactions, within understanding the attitudes that both victims and uh, perpetrators hold? Um, shall we start with Jeffrey and then move around to, um, to Jill? Um, and then Suzanne, I have a specific question for you that I'll follow up with after that. No, another fantastic question. And I was, I was really quite, um pleased to see that across our different angles of the criminal justice system and the different agents we may be working in supporting or, or taking through that actually it, it, it's a common theme, wasn't it? It's about, it's not just about the language, it's the cultural sensitivities around that. I think there's probably a lot of good learning that can be taken by support services who have who, who tackle you know I mentioned this in my presentation who tackle things like hate crime um, and, and terrorism where you know it's not asking the questions at all about you know your your in this case your your language proficiency and skills can do more damage than not it can make people feel like you don't really care about them what their needs are um, and what they're thinking and feeling. And, you know, anecdotally, research in the past with kind of victims of hate crimes, survivors and victims of terrorism, you often hear exactly that. The police don't ask why the police and victims, you know, support organizations and the wider criminal justice system don't ask why were you targeted or why do you think you were targeted, which could give such useful information around kind of, you know, gendered views um, faith, religion, you know, nat nationality specific elements that all tie into that language issue. So again, that's, that's my advice there is that we need to ask the questions, we need to do it tactfully, even if we can't do something immediately, having that knowledge, upskilling individuals will help facilitate that relationship and know who to seek out in the community for further help. Thank you, Jeffrey. Jill, any thoughts you'd like to add? Yeah, I was going to say in terms of um cultural barriers that kind of sit alongside language barriers, there were quite a few things that came up. So it, it came up a lot in our interviews that people acknowledged that that was just as important to understand those cultural barriers. Uh, often people, again, like they did with language, they'd refer to their colleagues uh, to, to help kind of um, work out what these barriers might be. And um, I know that 
Suzanne, you might want to say a bit about this, but that was something that we discussed in our probation interviews. There, there was an expectation also that interpreters could perhaps provide some of that cultural information that might have some kind of impact on, on communication. And, uh, you know, we didn't answer that question in our report because that's not for us, but it was something that could be discussed, you know, does that kind of cult a cultural translation fit within the role of the interpreter? And I also, Emily, this is possibly for you, there's wider work that Bell are funding that's specifically looking at the role of cultural mediation um, and developing that. And, and that's um, something Emily might have something more to say about. Beautiful segue there, Jill. So I'll pass that over to Emily and I'll come back to Suzanne. Yeah, thanks, Jill. That was a perfect introduction to what I was hoping to say. Uh, yeah, so the role of a cultural mediator is a really interesting one, but an organisation called, I urge everyone to go and have a look at the, the concept of cultural mediation, um, and an organisation called Hibiscus are looking at it at the moment with us. Um, it's a commonly used tool in Europe, uh, often in healthcare settings and things like that, and it, it is a form of interpretation that goes beyond language, and it as it as it says as it, it does what it says on the tin it mediates between two cultures um so it can be as simple as for example particular words for example about a sexual offense or gender-based violence certain words just literally don't exist in other cultures and trying to communicate between two people from two different cultures where you literally don't have the language is really difficult so someone who understands both of those cultures um is is absolutely, you know, it makes a huge difference. And it's something that Hibiscus in particular are looking at how we can all introduce small techniques for, from that. You don't have to go away and become a trained cultural mediator, but you can understand the basics of what might these cultural barriers look like and what can I do? What questions can I ask to overcome them? Um, so that is work in progress, uh, but uh, yes, I recommend, so I've just seen it pop up in the chat that someone asked the organization name. So yeah, Hibiscus Initiatives um, are a fantastic organization that work with women. Uh, and yes, go and, go and look them up and go and look up cultural mediation. Excellent, thank you, Emily. And just moving to Suzanne, is there anything you'd like to add as well, Suzanne? Um, I think a lot of it has been said. I think the misunderstandings kind of arise from what the limitations are for, it, for what, what services an interpreter can provide. And I think anyone going into a session, if there's if there's misunderstandings about each other's role and not just probation of interpreters, but but vice versa and the service user as well may, may be unclear of everyone's roles. I think starting a session where you're you're probably talking about some quite heavy stuff, quite sensitive information, entering into that kind of conversation with a lot of confusion is just going to cause more tension and some issues and you probably aren't going to get the information that you need out of the session. Um, I don't know, Stephen, if you have anything to add on to that. I mean, I was just thinking and reflecting on what Jill said about the importance of um, potentially drawing on colleagues, different backgrounds and how it kind of shines a light on the, on the value of having really diverse and representative workforces within our criminal justice agencies in, so that the people that they're coming into contact with if coming from different cultural backgrounds, different um, language uh, backgrounds are not necessarily as other the, 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 um, and than we might currently experience, particularly with some of the less diverse agencies. Great, thank you. I can see lots of um, conversation um, between Hibiscus and other people in the chat, so excellent that that's happening. Um, another question, uh, Jill, you talked about this um, uh, right at the start of the webinar today, about the use of volunteers as interpreters. Um, now, that might mean that interpreters who haven't had any kind of professional training. Yeah. And does that raise ethical questions and maybe in some cases a conflict of interest? What are your thoughts on that? And I will go around, I'd love to hear from other people on the panel too. No, I think it's very clear that um, we wouldn't be suggesting that this is something that should be used. Obviously, you know, having professional interpreters is, is the gold standard. But I think what we were really keen to do with the research is to see, OK, what is actually happening on the ground where resources are very limited and where we use that example, it, it was it was for kind of general discussions. It wasn't for anything legal. It was it was a service who were kind of developing because they couldn't they had no funding for professional interpretation. And I don't I think it has to be very carefully managed. And they offer training about the parameters of that role. Um, but 
but you know I think that's a positive thing it, it's a service innovating and kind of using resources that they have to help people so as long as it is carefully managed and it's clear in which circumstances it would be inappropriate to have a volunteer interpreter but it does happen and we know it happens regularly. Mm. Any other thoughts from people on the panel on that question? Okay, um, I'm going to put a question to Stephen now. Um, one of the threads that ran through um, everyone's sessions today was a vital importance of data collection and the lack of data that we have at the moment, both across statutory and non-statutory services on language needs. If you could, you know, wave a magic wand or a, a, a semi-practical magic wand, what would you do to kind of ensure that data is collected in a systematic and consistent manner so that we could have valuable data that comes out of that? I mean, I think that it'd be important if there was more transparency around the current use of interpreters, um, a clearer picture of when and how they're being used and the languages they're being used for. I think simple additions of data collection, particularly around first language, when it, whenever a criminal justice agency comes into contact with a new person would be really important in um, just giving an insight into the scale of demand. So that, that's probably two answers. I think you maybe only wanted one, but. No, two answers are always better than one answer. <laughs> that's great, thank you. Um, an interesting question that's come through um, and I'll put this to Jill first. Were there any instances in your research of people who spoke ESL who used their language skills as a way of deliberately not communicating with staff because they didn't want to engage with the criminal justice system? And do you have any suggestions on how to support staff or ESL speakers in these sorts of instances? Uh, I, I, we didn't have anyone suggest this was a common problem, you know. Um, so I what in terms of I guess is is the suggestion that it's like yeah I'm I'm not going to speak to you I'm not going to yeah um no it wasn't presented as something that was common um there might have been a few anecdotal mentions of, of that but um not something that came up it more, more so perhaps a, a fear or distrust of some criminal justice agencies which you know feeds back into the kind of cultural uh, potential cultural barriers where you might not completely trust a, a criminal justice, particularly the police, uh, probation, you know, that side of the criminal justice system. Um, and that might cause someone not to engage, but not being obstructive, no. Okay, that's really helpful. And we don't have much time left, but just I'm going to ask a question to everyone on the panel. Given the discussions that we've had today and, and noticing how, um, how how practical and grounded people's recommendations are. Is, what, what are the, the one or two things that we should start with um, in order to give this some momentum and accelerate um, some of the good practice that is out there already, given, as you were saying, the very kind of good intentions of, of people in the, in the space. Let's start with Jeffrey and then we'll work around the panel. I'm going to drag my two out, Rana. I'm just kidding. <laughs> i to leave things for everyone else. No, I think I have an easy answer to that. And if you think more widely, again, across the different actors and agencies that we're discussing, there's two practical things that probably need to happen in the first instance. The first is linked to that cultural element again. It's, and kind of based off what Stephen was briefly saying, if we want to ensure that we're that we're facilitating procedural fairness and justice across the criminal justice system, we need to have a diverse criminal justice agency. We need to have different individuals across protected characteristic with language and cultural skills so that those individuals, whether they are an alleged perpetrator or on probation or a witness or a victim, are able to identify themselves within this wider democratic social institution, that being the, the complex CJS. The second point, which is probably slightly more procedural, not procedural justice, should probably mince my words there ever so slightly, is that we need to stop treating the need of, of, of interpretation and translation support, possibly like a tick box exercise, if that makes sense. So it's not everybody I think is doing good work with the best intentions, but it's not enough to just tick that box and then provide a lackluster service 
that could have individuals disengage from the wider system, again, from the victim and witness perspective, not feel like they're being listened to or, or not have it, you know, if, if it's just, here's an interpreter, tell them what we just said, that's not good enough. Yeah, it's not an additional nice to have, is it? It's, it's fundamental to the experience. And I think that's something that I find research was particularly powerful at getting across. Um, Jill, what, what would you do? What would be your one or two things to start, start accelerating the process? Yeah, I think, I think also this has been mentioned by Emily as well, but it, 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 as I came out in the, the uh, research that I think starting to do a bit of an inventory of your service and what resources you actually currently have, you know, the, this language diversity within your organisation, but also then, and this comes back to the issue of data, knowing who your service users and potential service users are and tracking their languages and potential language requirements and, and being able to use that as a way to develop your service. I think these are quite relatively straightforward things to start doing to make it, you know, to, to, to improve things for speakers of ESL. Thank you, Jill. Um, Suzanne, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm coming from a kind of former practitioner background, so I would say training. I think training is essential to every practitioner who's trying to give that support to people, and particularly usually in quite time sensitive environments, as much practical, concise, clear training that practitioners can have is just really, really helpful when you're trying to do that day to day support. Great. Emily. Yeah, so um, most of it, yeah, I'm just going to reiterate what others have said, really, which is uh, always good to know that we're on the same page. So I think on, I look at it from the big picture and the small picture, um, the big picture, this is an equalities issue. This is a, an issue that should be thought of as such. Um, so in the same way that data is collected about other things, in the same way that standards have to be high for protected characteristics, that's what we want to change. That's what needs to happen. This is an equalities issue. People are being excluded, isolated because of a language barrier. So that needs to change. Um, so that's the big picture. We'll get there eventually. On a small scale, yeah, it's been said, but however small you are as an organization, we know, especially in the voluntary sector, everyone's working really hard. Everyone's trying their best. But when you work on something new, when you have a new form, just think of it in the back of your mind. Remember, language barriers exist. Get a second pair of eyes or perhaps a colleague who speaks ESL to have a look over something and just think about the accessibility of what you're doing and start small. You're not going to get it perfect straight away. This is, a, this is difficult. Um, and, you know, we know small charities are under-resourced, but start small, try your best and, it, and just make those small improvements to accessibility. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And one of the things that really struck me from the research and resonated with me personally as someone who is an, e is an ESL speaker is um, about the need to make that assessment at regular points through the process, not just once. And because our ability to speak e English varies enormously depending on where we are in the process and the amount of stress we're under and what's written and what's not written. Um, so I think it's extremely powerful. Stephen, oh, so I think it's did I hear someone was about to say something before? Sorry, I don't want to interrupt Stephen, but I was just going to say in terms of that assessing our own use of English, mm -hmm. I just wanted to kind of mention uh, some training we received from the Bell Foundation uh, before we started doing interviewing. And it was very worthwhile when you think you've made something very straightforward mm -hmm. and someone with this kind of language eye said, oh, no, no, this is really complicated. And, and yeah. you know, it makes you reflect. Or very much so and that was obviously in preparation for doing interviews but I would say that that can now be usefully applied more widely definitely sorry oh, no thank you Jill and let's put details of that in the chat because um, yes you know English is such a complex nuanced language I have no idea <laughs> no idea sorry Stephen we interrupted you what would be your one or two things well um I think I would agree with all of the one or two things that have already been mentioned but in addition to that I think there's something really important that's raised in Jill's research about the the lack of a structure for actually assessing when language support is required mm. um, and I think you know I, I look at someone called Tasnia has posted in the chat about a relative who was a victim of crime and was told they didn't need interpreter because their English was good enough for them to work as an uber driver and obviously that, that's just an anecdote but the fact that um, agencies don't have clear standards or for when they need to 
invoke language support is going to be really, really problematic. I think that's an, hopefully an easy thing to tackle, which could lead to lots more people getting the support that they um, need. Yeah. Now, I was really struck by that comment in the chat as well, Stephen. Well, um, can I say a huge thank you to our panellists uh, for their presentations and for your insights? Uh, today. I think it's a really powerful group of people we have, both as our speakers and um, looking at the chat and our participant list, people who we've got on this webinar today. So I hope this is just the first part of ongoing dialogue um, that comes out of these findings. Before we close, just a few things to look out for. So the Bell Foundation are launching a new grants programme in April for organisations who work with anyone who's in contact with the criminal justice system who speaks English as a second or additional language. So keep an eye out for that, um, or you can sign up to receive updates from our criminal justice programme, and we'll put um, details in the chat of how to do that. And as a foundation, uh, as many of you know, we're looking to help to build the capacity of the sector to support people who speak English as a second language, including with new training and resources, we've talked about the value of that, and by convening a community of practice. So if you'd be, like to be part of that, then please do reach out directly to Emily, whose details are in the chat. Uh, or we could also look out uh, for a follow-up email. Thank you. I feel we're only just starting. Um, and I, I think it'd be wonderful if we were able to at some stage kind of follow up again and see what um, progress we're making. Do go to our website and um, do read the full research because it is a, a fascinating read. Um, and thank you again to our panelists and to everyone who joined the webinar today. It was wonderful to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone.